we human beings, when we make a promise, often choose to have a physical, tangible symbol that formalizes that promise. We do it in a whole range of different ways. I can remember doing it in mid-November in the city of Austin, Texas. Mid-November, that means there's a bit of a chill in the air. Anita and I walked into a very nice hotel, took the elevator to the top floor, entered a beautiful restaurant overlooking the Colorado River. I had two items in my pockets, and I was nervous. One of those items was a Bible. It was just a little Bible, small Bible, but very nice Bible, leather-bound. If you open the pages of this book and read, it will tell you to live by faith and not by sight, right? So I decided to do that. And I asked the bookseller, would you kindly emboss this, write a name in gold on the front of this Bible? Write the name Anita Roberts. <laughs> by faith, right? <laughs> and I was nervous. The moment came during our meal when I slid that Bible across the table and became so choked up I had a hard time getting out the most important question of my life. Faith. <laughs> Fortunately, God rewards faith, and so does Anita, <laughs> or I wouldn't be telling you this story. It became, that Bible, that simple Bible became a physical, tangible symbol of a promise. Later, not that long later, but later, something else, a wedding band, would become a symbol of that promise as well. You know how people engrave things inside of bands, together forever, I will love you always in the date, those kinds of things. We, we had a colleague here at the church some years ago who took his off, and his wife had engraved inside of it. It said, what is this doing off? <laughs> <laughs> because it's a symbol, a physical symbol of a promise that has been made. Do you realize that Scripture is filled with those kinds of physical symbols of promises and covenants that exist? Noah and his rainbow, Abraham and, and circumcision, thank God for Noah, Jacob and an altar, David and Jonathan and a robe, John the Baptist and the waters of the Jordan River. Or in an upper room about 2,000 years ago, Jesus, surrounded by his reclining disciples around a low table, gave them a physical, tangible symbol of a promise he was making to them. Now, we have to, in imagination, join that scene. It's Passover week. There's a heaviness in the air. The disciples clearly are aware but uncertain, and so they focus in more carefully on what Jesus is saying, maybe than they ever have. It is in that setting that he makes two statements I want you to notice today. They're found in Luke's Gospel, the 22nd chapter. We begin reading in Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Twice he makes a statement about the kingdom. The first time, it's a big picture reality. He's talking about the Passover and the entire celebration of Passover, which exceeded just the meal itself. He's talking about that, that moment of liberation that the ancient Hebrews experienced when God broke the bonds of slavery and set them free, and they were now free to face a new future ahead. 
to celebrate the freedom that God desired for them. He makes a big picture statement about that. It's as though he's saying to them, look, you think this is a celebration of freedom. It is. But it will not compare with the celebration of freedom that will come when you truly have the bounds, the bonds of slavery broken, when you are in the true promised land, and when you truly are in the presence of God. That's what's coming. Passover celebration in the kingdom. But, he makes a smaller, more specific statement about the cup. The cup. It might be a bit confusing if you read through this section of Luke's telling of the story because he talks about a cup on more than one occasion. So let me share with you the words of New Testament scholar Clinton Arnold that I think can help us understand a bit better what's happening that night. Arnold writes, The traditional Passover celebration use four cups of wine, four. The first with an opening benediction over the Passover day. The second after the explanation of the Passover and the singing of the first part of the Hallel. That was the song of praise from Psalm 113 and 114. The third following the meal of unleavened bread, lamb, and bitter herbs. The fourth following the concluding portion of the Hallel. Luke refers to two cups, verses 17 and 20. But it is debated by scholars which two, of the, which two these were. It seems likely that the second cup, in verse 20, is the third Passover cup. The cup in verse 17, that's the verse that we read. The cup in verse 17 is probably the first cup since it accompanies Jesus' introduction to the meal. It's as though he offers what we might call a toast at the beginning and sets the stage, sets the theme for all that is to follow. And when he does so, in a very specific and personal way, he gives them a promise. Again, verses 17 and 18. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He makes them a promise. A promise about the coming kingdom. He gives them a cup. The liquid of which will sweeten their lips and encourage their hearts. But there's a promise in that cup. It's the promise of the kingdom to come. So how do we take that and make that our own? How do we experience what Jesus desired? There can be a temptation to say, this is just a ritual. doesn't have any deep meaning for us. think I'll go to the beach today. But maybe there's something profound here. I would suggest three realities that are important if we are to take that in. The first reality is we have to perceive it. We have to perceive the promise. Let me explain. It's tempting to think that some of these acts are just, well, they're physical symbols, but because we don't want to go too far and claim too much for the physical symbols, we don't claim enough for them. We don't say enough about them. So some Christian confessions, some of our brothers and sisters and other denominations, speak of this as a sacrament. As Protestants, we've been very nervous with that term, and we have pushed back against it because we say there's nothing magical happening here, and we push back against that sense of sacrament. But William Barclay helps us to understand the true reality of sacrament when he says, Jesus said of the bread, this is my body. Herein is exactly what we mean by a sacrament. A sacrament is something, usually a very ordinary thing, which has acquired a meaning far beyond itself for those who have eyes to see and hearts to understand. There is nothing especially theological or mysterious about this. In the house of every one of us, there's a drawer full of things which can only be called junk. 
And yet we will not throw them out because when we touch and handle and look at them, they bring back this person or that person, this or that occasion. They are common things, but they have a meaning far beyond themselves. That is a sacrament. Something common, but which has a much larger meaning. In my bedside table drawer was a watch, a Timex watch. You remember Timex before Apple? It was a silver Timex. I don't think, I don't think you could have gotten $10 for it, if that, at a pawn shop. But it held great meaning for me. That was the watch. Dad told me, come along. We drove to Fort Worth, stood at a watch shop, and he said, we don't have a lot, but pick within this price range. And that was the watch. So when thieves broke into our house and stole many things, including that watch, it took something out of me. You couldn't get five dollars, ten dollars for that. But it meant so much to me. That's this meal. Just simple symbols. But if we perceive the deeper meaning, it's the life of our Lord. So when we participate, we need to perceive the meaning. But the second way of making it our own is not only to, per to perceive it, but to receive it. If somebody is offering us a promise and we don't reach out and take hold of it and receive it, then the entire reality of what's being offered breaks down. Suppose, for example, if I had slid that Bible across the table and Anita had picked it up and said, they put the wrong last name on here. I wouldn't be telling you this story. There has to be on the other side a receptive heart that receives it and that takes it in, that participates in the promise. There's a special moment in a wedding ceremony. I've had the wonderful privilege to stand at the wedding altar many times with precious people. There's a very special moment when the officiant says, would you repeat after me? With this ring, I thee wed. And then slip it on the finger of your future spouse. Now, if that person just keeps their arms behind them, we got trouble right here in River City. They have to reach out, extend, receive it, participate in this exchange, powerful and loving, that is taking place. That's what happens at this table. Jesus, says the text, gave them a cup. Be thankful that we celebrate it as it is, or we'd be sending cups down the row, and you'd each be drinking from that cup. You'd be very careful by whom you're sitting. He gives them a cup and says, partake all of you, because I won't do it again until the kingdom. Calls to mind those pilgrims in ancient Israel who could not make it to Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover, and they would always say, next year in Jerusalem. Next time, Jesus says, in the kingdom. Will you receive it? So what we do here today, we have to perceive the promise. We have to receive the promise. And thirdly, we have to believe the promise. We have to express our faith, our trust in the Lord who said, I am going, but I will come again. Rest in that trust, in that promise. I was taken by something a theologian named Dale Bruner writes. He says, the best parable of trust we have in our home is our cat. He's a scholar, so the cat is named Clement of Alexandria. He had a companion cat, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. 
but a local coyote ate the archbishop recently. <laughs> Sorry. When our cat goes outside, he lives in terror. He looks around as though it's a jungle, and he's constantly terrified. But when he comes in the house, he lies on the floor right between the kitchen and the dining room where we walk most frequently and falls asleep in total trust. My wife Kathy and I could accidentally step on Clement, but he trusts us. Our cat lives in complete, total confidence in his human companions. In this connection, I love this, in this connection, I think the best animal synonym for faith is purring. Purring. Wow. Every time I see Clement just lying there, I say to myself, that's what Jesus wants me to do, to just trust him. The kind of trust the cat shows in us is the kind of trust Jesus Christ invites from us. Are you purring in Jesus? Trust him. Believing. If you are, then as you come to this table, as you eat the bread, as you take that cup, there's a promise in that cup. As you take that cup and the liquid sweetens your lips, it will deeply encourage your heart because you believe the promise. And so we come to the table today to participate. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we practice an open communion, meaning that if you are joining us as a guest today from another communion, you are welcome at our table. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we also practice something else, modeled on the words and the model of Jesus in John's Gospel, the 13th chapter, we wash each other's feet. So before we come to the table, we wash. We hope that you'll join us in both acts. We'll leave this worship space and go. It's kind of right in front of you. You'll see the signs that indicate the rooms where there will be men and women and families that can participate together. And then we'll come back here to perceive and receive and believe the promise.